Good evening, all of you. Sorry to interrupt your dinner, but please keep on eating. So, dear guests, dear faculty, dear staff, dear students, welcome to the first faculty installation of the academic year 2018-19. To me, I love these events. This is one of my favorite things to do every year is these faculty installation dinners. The reason I love them is, first of all, it's obviously a great pleasure to honor someone within our midst. And all the more so if that someone happens to be Mark Huber, who is absolutely an amazing scholar, teacher, and human being. Second of all, it's fun to sort of hear a talk about something that typically is not your field, except for the 15 mathematicians in the room and a couple of <laughs> physics professors and so on. But for many of us, it's not at all our field, and normally I wouldn't be going to it, and many of us wouldn't. But for this occasion, we go and we typically learn a lot and we feel reinvigorated by the whole thing. So that's another reason I love these events. Thirdly, obviously, we get to break bread with colleagues and hang out and have a glass of Malbec before they rudely take it away. And <laughs> that too is obviously always a lot of fun too. It's nourishing to the soul and to the brain at the same time. And then finally, it allows us to thank the people in the institution who have done, the institutions who have done great things for this college and allowed it to become the place it is today. And starting with that, obviously, my first thank should go to the Fletcher Jones Foundation for their continued support of our faculty and students at Clement McKenna. Um, this, by the way, is actually the second professorship we have from the Fletcher Jones Foundation. Um, and Mark is the inaugural chair of this particular, you're the first one, right? Yeah, you are, yes. The first and absolutely the best um, <laughs> so far. And the, uh, the, <laughs> the other professorship, <laughs> yeah, I'm a scientist, I always hedge. The, <laughs> the other professorship is held by Mark Blitz, uh, who is a professor of government and the Fletcher Jones Foundation. Well, actually, he's a Fletcher Jones Foundation professor of political philosophy. So let me first thank very much Mary Spellman, who is the executive director and treasurer of the Fletcher Jones Foundation. She is here tonight. Thank you for coming. I also want to thank somebody who is not here, but who nonetheless has been important to all of this. And this is our own trustee, Peter Barker, who is the president of the Fletcher Jones Foundation. Now, let me continue right away to the more formal part of this program, which itself is the pre prelude to the talk that Mark will give. The title is out there. Um, Mark Huber earned a Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics from a place called Harvey Mudd College. <laughs> I've heard of it. And, uh, and an MA and PhD in Operations Research and Industrial Engineering from Cornell University. His specialty is computational probability and he enjoys developing new algorithms for drawing random variates from complex distributions quickly, which has applications to statistics, machine learning, numerical integration, and physics. Clement McKenna welcomed Mark to campus in 2009. So he's been here now nine years, and through that period you have quickly risen to become a full professor. Um, as you will hear from Mark tonight, he is passionate about mathematics and enjoys sharing his enthusiasm and knowledge with his students and colleagues. Mark's unique background in mathematics, computing, and statistics allows him to move easily between disciplines. I know that because he's on every single committee we have, <laughs> and he does indeed move seamlessly between all of them, and he's very important to the college in that respect. Outside of the classroom, he has served as chair of the CMC Mathematical Sciences since 2016. He also serves as associate editor for the Journal of American Statistical Association Reviews and editor of the Journal of Humanistic Mathematics, um, which you can find online and is extremely interesting to read even for non-mathematicians. I highly recommend it. He regularly participates as a guest lecturer at conferences and institutions around the world, and his research has appeared in many, many different journals. In short, Mark is a great scholar, an excellent teacher, and a marvelous colleague. I'm honored to be able to present Mark today with his medallion. Mark, could you please join me here at the podium? Amen. 
So, Mark, as dean of the faculty, it is my honor to present you with this medallion. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> the front features the seal of the college, and the back recognizes you as the Fletcher Jones Foundation Professor of Mathematics and Statistics and George R. Roberts Fellow. This medallion is a physical representation of the endowed chair that you hold and is worn with your academic regalia. The floor is all yours. Well, thank you, Peter, for those kind words. And of course, thanks to the Fletcher Jones Foundation for uh, making uh, this chair possible. Since I am now the Fletcher Jones Foundation Professor of Mathematics and Statistics, I thought I'd start by telling you what mathematics and statistics are. Uh, <laughs> mathematics, I'm going to say, is the study of abstract structures and knowledge. Now, if you ask 10 different mathematicians what mathematics are, is you'll get 10 different answers. Uh, same thing for statistics. But this is, the, this is the definition that I'm going to use. And statistics is something quite different, despite what some people think. Uh, statistics is the study of using data to learn about the world and to make decisions. So first, I'm going to say a little bit about mathematics. I was told to keep this talk relatively mathematically simple. So I'm going to try and do that. Suppose a farmer owns three cows and buys four more cows. How many cows does he have? Seven, all right. <laughs> Excellent. An airline owns three planes and buys four more planes. How many planes do they have? Seven, yeah. And that, in a nutshell, is mathematics. Mathematics is about taking the unnecessary parts of a problem, the unnecessary parts of the world, and stripping them away to reveal the underlying structure underneath. Now, in this case, the structure is the positive integers. Uh, one, two, three, and it goes on from there, I'm told. Uh, the operation is addition. Okay? And when you think about that, when you think about how beautiful it is that addition will work whether I'm talking about cows or planes or planets or economies or countries or uh, silverware, it's just amazing that mathematics works as well as it does, but it does. And that's far from the only structure that mathematicians study. Uh, the integers, a natural extension of the positive integers, real numbers, computable numbers, complex numbers, groups, fields, directed graphs, quandles, uh, lattices, all of these are mathematical structures that are intended to solve particular problems. And what a mathematician does is boil the essence of the problem down to the barest minimum and then see what you can do from there. And it's surprising sometimes just how far you can go. So what's statistics? Well, so now we have seven cows. Should I buy more? That's statistics in a nutshell. In order to decide whether or not we need to we need more cattle for our farm. We're going to need some data. We're going to need to know the price of the cow. We're going to need to know the average revenue that we'll make from it. We'll need to know what the market's like. We're going to need to predict what the market's going to do in the future. There's a, it opens up a whole host of other questions, many of which can be analyzed using mathematics. But the questions themselves, the questions that drive the discipline, come from the statistician. And of course, you have the need to analyze the data uh, once you actually have it. Uh, for the cows, of course, you need to find a mu. OK, so in order to <laughs> oh, I almost slipped that one by. Uh, so in order to, to better describe what mathematics is, uh, someone asked me a few months ago, when did I become interested in mathematics? When did I first do mathematics? And I realized that I was doing mathematics without realizing it as a kid, partially because the, the types of activities that I did that, that are real mathematics are rarely recognized as mathematics uh, in, in our society. 
But the things that I do remember all go back to the same year, 1980. And uh, those of you who lived through the period know that I was not being outlandish in my color selection. Uh, this is what it was like. And I'm going to tell you about three levels of mathematics. And because anytime you do three levels of something, uh, Dante did it first, I'm going to start at the bottom in the inferno. Now, of course, even Inferno has a, a nice uh, mathematical uh, uh, mnemonic help. Inferno, of course, didn't originally mean something fiery. It meant something below, underground, which is why it's down there. And of course, mathemat mathematicians use the infimum to remember the lower bound on a set of items. So if you can remember that Dante's Inferno is below us, you can remember what the infimum is. So that's just a helpful mnemonic for uh, uh, students as they go through. But anyway, what kind of math problems do you find in the Inferno? Well, you find these kinds of problems, right? Billy is twice as old as Sally was when Billy was as old as Sally is now, and the sum of their ages is 28. How old are they now? Man, that is terrible. <laughs> For so many reasons. So I typed the words Billy and Sally age problem into Google and got 9.2 million hits. This is how ubiquitous this problem is, but it's terrible. What is wrong with Sally and Billy that they don't just ask each other how old they are? Why are they playing these mind games with each other? Um, and linguistically, wrapping your head around, that problem isn't hard because the math is hard. The problem is hard because the English is hard. Just trying to figure out what it's even asking and what information you have. Oh. But unfortunately, this is what people are exposed to as children. It would be child abuse in any other setting. And so that's what they think math is. And that's really unfortunate. Okay, so let's, um, what is the types of things that you find in the inferno? Well, you know, piano lessons, learning the names of notes, learning how to hold your hands, uh, art, learning the names of colors. I, I watched a, a, a parent drill a small child, and, and what color is that? And what color is that? And, what, and by the third one, she turned around, I don't care anymore. <laughs> and yeah, okay. <laughs> Computers, how to type. No one wants to learn how to type, but it's really useful once, once you've done it. And of course, in mathematics, we have things like the dreaded multiplication tables and uh, these silly word problems that we have to do. But let's, let's leave the inferno uh, where it belongs and head up to, to a more pleasant place, uh, purgatorial. Uh, purgatory is kind of considered bad nowadays, but I don't know, it, it, it seems nice. Uh, <laughs> okay, so at this second level, you're no longer being told what to do. Uh, instead, you have a goal and you're working to achieve that goal. So for instance, when I was a kid, back in 1980 actually, my favorite song was the Imperial March, you know, the theme from The Empire Strikes Back. I, I, it was partially because I love Star Wars, it was partially because it's the first song I ever heard in a minor key, right? Which is interesting to a kid. Every other kid song is major key, major key, major key. Kids can handle minor keys, they won't, they won't fall apart or become sinister. But anyway, uh, I, loved, I loved that song and so, when I did take piano lessons, I took piano lessons right up until the point that I could play that song and then I quit. Because that was my goal. It was my goal to learn how to be able to reproduce that. Of course, we don't have MP3 players back then in, in 1980. So that was the only way I was gonna get to hear that song without buying a, uh, buying a movie ticket. Okay, so in art, you may have to learn how to draw a cow. Maybe you're giving a presentation and you realize you want to draw a tiny little cow and so you have to learn how to, how to do that. Computers running programs and applications. So if you're going to be a successful these days, you have to know how to use programs. And in mathematics, you have to be able to solve problems that come from a model. But in all of these instances, you know what your goal is and that's what makes things special. So my first experience of this, this sort of level one, of getting away from, uh, from the base of, of Billy and Sally problems, uh, I was living in Corvallis, Oregon, and my mom happened to be an adjunct professor at Lynn Benton Community College. And in those days, uh, we had in-services the same way that we have in-services now. And back then, people weren't quite as careful with their children, so they could take them and leave them in a computer lab for several hours by themselves. Uh, that was totally
totally socially acceptable. I'm not blaming <laughs> there in any way. Uh, nowadays, child services would have been called. But anyway, uh, and in that lab, they had a computer that had the worst marketing department of all time. Uh, it was made by Tandy. It was sold by Radio Shack. So it was called the TRS-80. Everyone, and I was eight at the time, and even I knew this, called the computer a trash 80. Uh, it was affectionately called a trash 80, but you really need to think about your acronym uh, when, when you're naming computers, okay? But that's not the moral of the story. The moral of the story is that this was the first computer that I ever saw. And when I went to this lab, the, there was somebody there, you know, running the lab, and he loaded up a game that was called Hammurabi. Now, those of you who are history buffs will uh, notice that in my title, I have something missing that's in the, the lower title. It lost an M. And for some reason, somebody, when they were copying it, you know, from year to year, one of the M's in Hammurabi got dropped. So, so the computer game now is Hammurabi with one M. And that turned out to be extremely fortuitous because in 2018, when I was putting together this talk and wanted to search for Hammurabi, I wasn't beset with web pages about the Sumerian king and the Hammurabi code. I could directly find the program simply by typing in Hammurabi with one M. So misspellings are actually useful sometimes. Uh, <laughs> this was a game that was created for teletype machines. Now, uh, a teletype machine is like a monitor that works extraordinarily slowly. Uh, so it would literally print out every line of the output as it was going um, around. And so it was a very basic game. It was a, it was a game that used uh, text to interact. And when you fired up Hammurabi, this was the first thing that you saw. You were told, uh, try your hand at governing ancient Sumeria for a 10-year term of artifice. Now, I, I want to emphasize that when I fired this up and started this game, this was all I saw. There were no instructions. There were no indication of what you should do or what you should try. This was it. And it just left you to your own devices to decide what you should do next. Now, I start off with uh, 2,800 bushels in store. And tr land is trading at 26 bushels per acre. Well, nobody wants to divide 20, 26 into 2,800. So I rounded and thought, well, maybe 100 is a good idea. And then I thought better of it, because if land costs 26 bushels per acre and I spend 100, well, most people can do that particular multiplication problem in their head, and I'm spending 2,600 bushels, which only leaves me with 200, uh, that's probably not enough for my, for my population. So I'm going to drop that down to 50. Again, not out of any sort of knowledge or anything about it, but I'm doing an experiment. Okay, and how many pe bushels do you wish to feed your people? I figured, okay, 1,000 bushels, that's fine. That, that should work. That, that really, um, okay, and then they, they asked, after that, you, you take whatever seed you have left over and asked how, how many acres do you wish to plant with seed? And I said, okay, 900 acres, let's say. It turns out that was a mistake. <laughs> By feeding my people 1,000 uh, bushels per acre, I starved 50 people in one year. And due to this extreme management, you have not only been impeached and thrown out of office, but you have also been declared national fink. I went and asked my mother this evening, what is a fink? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know what she thought. She'd seen Davy Crockett, so she told me the story of Mike Fink, the, the riverboat person. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I knew that I did not want to be in National Fink. So fired up the program again. And this time, if I starved half my people by giving them 1,000, I should give them 2,000. And hopefully that will be enough uh, for, all, for all the people. Okay, well... Success. Zero people starved. And what makes this uh, a level one mathematics rather than level two was because now I had a goal, not to starve my people. It was a good goal, I thought. And by achieving that goal, I felt good. So, you know, I got the, the usual dopamine hit that, that playing video games and computer games gives you. And I wanted to do more. The next time around, uh, 
I had 103 people, because three people uh, immigrated. And what I did was I fed them 2,000 again, because I was doing an experiment. I wanted to know, were people actually eating 20 bushels per person per year? And yeah, three people starved. It, it's not an experiment that would pass the Human Resources Board today. But uh, it was fine for, for this. And now I knew, yes, OK, people ate 20 bushels. And, and I could go from there. And the other thing I saw is that land is trading at 17 bushels per acre. And that was much lower than what it was trading at before. So I decided to buy uh, some acres. I bought, uh, how many did I buy? 100. OK, so things are going pretty well. Uh, in fact, I harvested more bushels per acre than, than I had before the next year. And I saw that land is trading at 23 bushels per acre. Oh, that's a lot higher. So now's a good time to, to sell. So um, except I didn't really, I wasn't sure that 23 was high enough. So, so I did sell. And, and things kept going this way for a while. And uh, then a horrible plague struck. <laughs> <laughs> and half my population died, and that's when I learned that life is not fair. Uh, but mathematically, I learned about random effects. Uh, when you have a model, there are random effects that can, can change what's going on uh, in a moment. And unless you uh, have those, understand those random effects and acknowledge them, uh, you're going to be in trouble. Now, at this point, land was trading at 25 bushels per acre. So I went ahead and sold 500 acres in order to get more. Uh, people were coming to the city in droves because I had a lot of acres, because I had a lot of bushels in, in store. And things went pretty smoothly for the, for the final two years. Um, it, OK, there was one more plague. <laughs> Relatively smoothly for the last two years. But then I got success. And that, that felt good. Um, a fantastic performance, the, the opposite of being the national think. Uh, Charlemagne, Disraeli, and Jefferson combined could not have done better. Uh, and then it drops you out with so long for now. Um, and this was interesting to me, first because I realized that now that I have a PhD in operations research, I could actually defeat this game in two tries, when I remember it taking me hours and hours of, of learning before. So there is something to be gained from a PhD. But I also realized that what made this game so fascinating, the reason I could remember this game 30 some odd years later, was because it engaged me in a way that none of the other problems that I did in, in school did. And what was it about this game? Well, it was open-ended. Each year was a different word problem. And the word problems made sense. I wasn't just doing the word problem because Billy and Sally refused to communicate. I was doing the word problem so that people didn't starve. How noble is that? Uh, there was randomness. Each experience is different. And that also kept things fresh every time I, I was trying to do different things. I got feedback. I got instant feedback on decisions. A, f a few years back, uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote in Outliers about how you need 10,000 hours of practice to become an expert in anything. And immediately, a bunch of sociologists and psychologists wrote angry screeds about just doing 10,000 hours isn't enough. You need to be under the training of someone. You need to get feedback on what you're doing in order to find out whether you're doing things the, the correct way or not. Agency, I was in control rather than a book teacher lesson. I was able to do things at my own pace. If it took me a long time to, to do the math, that was fine. I was okay with that. And I knew why I was doing the arithmetic. So that's what, for me, a, a level one thing is, where you're faced with a model, you're faced with a situation and a goal, and then you use the mathematics to solve that goal, to push through. But there's a level above that, paradiso. And how do we get to that level in mathematics? I have to say, uh, I do think Purgatorio is a nice place. I do spend a lot of time there uh, working on math problems that have been created by other people, that are models that are given to me by statisticians, by physicists, by sociologists, uh, trying to find the mathematics needed to solve their particular model. But Sometimes I make it one step further. And to illustrate that, uh, for instance, in music, 
when you're composing, when you're creating your own music. That is that second level. You're not trying to play a piece that someone else has done, no matter how brilliant. You're humming your own tune. You're, you're, you're doing improv. You're creating. You don't have to be a professional composer to compose a piece of music. It can just be a tune that you, that you whistle in the morning. And in the same way, you don't have to be a professional mathematician to do level two mathematics. You just have to recognize when you need to think about a problem or when you need to create some new idea, some new way of scheduling your day or moving from place to place or, or uh, setting up uh, uh, what you're going to do with your, with your I want to say resources because that's, <laughs> that's a terrible word. What you want to do with your opportunities, let me put it that way. In computers, creating your own algorithms, programming your own methods. Um, in level one, the, the program, the game Hammurabi, was set for me. I wasn't able to change things. I wasn't able to change the, the, um, the, the cost of, of bushels. I wasn't able to change how often plague struck. In mathematics, it's creating your own proofs, your own patterns, your own structures. So that is, in some sense, the height of mathematics. That's what makes people um, become passionate about it. Now, the second computer I saw, the first was that uh, Trash 80. Uh, the second was an Apple II that my elementary school uh, bought, uh, again, in, in 1980. And that's what an Apple II looked like. And that's what the Apple II basic programming model looked like. Um, it was interesting because at that time, I had no interest in doing mathematics whatsoever. I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to draw, I wanted to animate. Uh, I'd seen you know, several Disney movies at that point, and I wanted to bring things to life. I wanted to, uh, to, to draw, and I could not draw to save my life. Now, some of you having seen the cow in plain pictures think, he still can't draw. But that being said, uh, when I was eight, it was really bad. You would not have wanted to see my eight-year-old cow. So uh, what I found was that I could achieve my goal of creating art through the computer. And that, to me, was a revelation because the only other computer I'd seen had already been programmed for me. So the fact that I could program the computer and create things was, was really magical. And my first program was like most people's first program, the Hello World program. Print Hello World. Okay, let's move on. So <laughs> I wanted graphics. And in the Apple II basic system, you typed GR to put it into graphics mode. And once you were in graphics mode, that's when you could change things. Color equals 15 means that it's going to be white, the, the, uh, the pixel that I place, and I'm plotting a pixel at 10 and 15. Well, is that 10 units over and 15 down? Or is that 15 down and 10 over? Is it 15 up and 10 to the right? Let's run an experiment. I then plotted 10 and 20 and saw, oh, it's five steps below where it was before. So when I'm plotting, it's moving down from the top in the second coordinate and from the left in, in the first coordinate. You can expand upon that. Instead of plotting a single pixel, you can plot a horizontal line with the hlin command. The 10 and the 15 tell you the x coordinates, and then the 10 tells you the y coordinate. And at that point, I was in business. Because now, I could make my vision, the images that I had in my head, come to life simply by playing around with the coordinates, moving things around. And so I made a cloud. <laughs> that was my first uh, computer graphics. But of course, no landscape is complete with one cloud. I needed two clouds. Fortunately, that's easy once you have things in a computer. All I did was take everything and I added 15 to all of the x coordinates, I added uh, 5 to all of the y coordinates, and I had my second cloud. Now, of course, you don't typically see white clouds in the middle of a uh, sky black uh, <laughs> uh, day. So I wanted to add a background. I wanted to add a blue background. And I quickly realized that if I typed hlin 0 to 39 at 1, did it at 2, did it at 3, 
it was going to be bad. Uh, the computers in those days didn't have text editors. There was no way to cut and paste and copy and, and change. I would have had to type in everything by hand. So I learned about for loops. <laughs> so um, I also learned, by the way, those of you who, who noticed that um, I, was, I was pretty good about my line numbers. In, in the old days, you had to put line numbers in each command so it would know the order in which to execute the commands. It would do 10 first, then 20, then 110, 100. Well, my next commands were to fill in the sky. 130, 140, 150, 160. And I realized after I wrote it that I was covering my clouds when I did that. I was putting the sky on top of my clouds instead of putting the sky behind my clouds. So that's why suddenly there's a line 16, 14, 16, 18, and 20, because I needed to paint my uh, clouds before I painted my, uh, or sorry, paint my sky before I painted my clouds. And I learned about for loops. And at this point, I was in business. There was no stopping me. I added a couple mountains, and boom, I had a landscape for the first time. Oh, I also added a sun, it looks like. Okay. And that was great. But later on, I realized how much math I had learned by doing this. Of course, the most basic thing I learned were Cartesian coordinates. Now, they're different than the Cartesian coordinates that we typically use in that, yes, the x moved to the right, but the positive y's were moving down instead of up, which is a little different. But that's easy enough to wrap, wrap your head around. More importantly, I learned how to shift an object a number of spaces to the right simply by adding five to, to each of the coordinates. And I learned how to shift an object a, a fixed number of spaces down. I also learned something which is so valuable in math, which is how to break your problem down into manageable pieces. I had the sky, I had each piece for the clouds, I had the sun, they were an independent piece. Once you've done low-res graphics like this with pixels, differential elements in calculus are easy because the only way you can approximate a function is with something which looks like those Riemann sums uh, that you see. So that turned out to make things easy. And of course, I learned about logical or and 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 at the time too. Now, I didn't remember this, but I was reading the, um, uh, the, the manual, again, uh, in preparation for this talk, and I realized that I'd probably also done my first Monte Carlo simulation. Now, for those of you who don't know, Monte Carlo simulation just refers to any simulation where there are random effects. Hammurabi was an example of a Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, the name came from uh, the inventor of the method, Stanislaw Ulam, who worked on the Manhattan Project, and he had a friend, Nick Metropolis, and Nick knew that he was an uh, avid gambler. And of course, there's this casino in Monte Carlo, uh, the Grand Casino de Monte Carlo, and so he called it a Monte Carlo method, and the name stuck. And so ever since then, simulations that use randomness in order to improve the running time, in order to make things go faster, they're known as Monte Carlo simulations. And the very first one that I did is simulating a pair of dice. You'd have a red die, a white die, and it added them together. Um, it, the adding together is on the next page. So. Uh, but, that's enough time in 1980. Let's come back to the present. Uh, 2018, how am I using the lessons that I've learned uh, from, those, from those early days? Well, in my research, I use those lessons every day. Uh, I, my research is in using randomness to make algorithms more efficient, how to do Monte Carlo simulation that uh, allows us to approximate high dimensional integrals, that allows us to predict what's going to happen in financial markets with more efficiency, meaning using as little computer time as possible. Statistical inference has also become very heavily dependent on Monte Carlo methods. Uh, those old things that you learned in school about the t-test and all that, those were very limited. They were limited to very specific examples, very specific models. The models have become infinite in variety, and the reason for that is because we have more powerful tools for finding things like confidence intervals, for finding effect sizes, and of course, there's been the rise of Bayesian statistics. Faster decision making. That's the final reason uh, that, that you want to use Monte Carlo methods. Now, in uh, my service, uh, Peter mentioned this, the Journal of Humanistic Mathematics. 
What this is, is it's an open access journal where people can tell us their stories. They can be stories about their first mathematical experience or something that they, they learned in high school or something that they learned the other day when they were uh, visiting the Museum of Math in New York City. Maybe they had a great experience there and want to share how that, how that made them feel. And up until that point, there really wasn't a place for those types of stories, for those types of, of experiences. And one of the things that we hope to, to convince people is that mathematicians are people too. Uh, we're not cold, we're not unfeeling, uh, we're not unfriendly, uh, we're not Sheldon. Uh, we are, in fact, reasonable, nice people uh, who have tales of our mathematical lives. And so, and so that's what that's done, and it's, it's, been, a, it's been a real success. Uh, we had support from the Claremont College's library. They got us rolling with the, uh, with the people, BE Press, who, who run our website, who organize things. And so they take care of, you know, uh, keeping track of the peer review and keeping track of the editors and, and all of the, the, the little uh, things that take so much of, of our time. And so we end up with something that looks very nice, very professional, even though only two people are running it. That would have been impossible to do 15 years ago. Now uh, we've been running it for about six years, and we have a couple hundred thousand downloads of our articles, maybe 200,000. Okay, in my teaching, uh, one of the things that I want to do is make sure that people have access to the mathematics. One of the things that, that I feel really was unfortunate is that I scrounged uh, books and textbooks uh, where I could. I lived in college towns, and it wasn't easy finding college math books. Mathematicians do tend to, to be pack rats sometimes. Uh, they will hang on to their, their undergraduate books, uh, many of them. And so there weren't a lot you know, floating around in the market. So one of the things that I'm doing is, for all of the courses that I teach, I'm writing textbooks that are open access, free to download, free to use in courses. And uh, that's been a real pleasure for me because I've been able to update it as students come in and tell me all the errors that, uh, <laughs> that they find. Uh, but moreover, I, I feel it's, it's, it really makes me feel good to give back in that small way. Uh, now that I'm knowledgeable enough to actually write a textbook, to be able to write a textbook and just send it out into the world is, uh, for me, a really special thing. The other thing that I've been doing in teaching is I, I used to always do three days a week lecture, and I still do for some of my courses. Sorry those who are signed up for Monte Carlo. Uh, but for a lot of my courses, one day a week now, I set aside to be labs. And uh, this is an example of one of the labs that I have students do. And as I was reading that Apple II basic programming model, I realized I was doing you know, syntax and questions in a very similar fashion uh, to, to that manual so long ago. And, and that's a pretty common thing in, in the computer sciences. The nice thing about computers is that they make mathematics solid. Mathematics is such an abstract object. It, it's, it's something that numbers don't exist. They live in your brain. Uh, and computers take those brain things, I'm a mathematician, not a linguist, uh, and bring them back down so that you can actually visualize them, so that you can picture them. And that's a really great thing, and that's, that's what I try and do in these labs. So, of course, um, I do want to thank again uh, the Fletcher Jones Foundation. Uh, I've been reading up on, on Fletcher Jones, and he really was an amazing guy. Um, it turns out he was a software guy. Uh, he founded uh, Computer Sciences Corporation uh, together with one of the people who, who helped develop Fortran. And so he really was, you know, together with his partner, really the, the Steve Jobs and, and Steve Wozniak of, of, of his time. Um, and it's, it's nice to know that people decided that a, a, an effective way to carry on his legacy was to uh, create this foundation which does support education across Southern California, uh, often in mathematics. 
a few years back, there was a Fletcher Jones uh, research experience for undergraduates. So I know that they're always trying different things. They're always trying to uh, reach out and try new programs and get new things started. So uh, I have to say I'm, I'm quite proud and honored uh, to, to be the, the Fletcher Jones Foundation Professor of Mathematics and Science. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Huber. Uh, we'll now open the floor for questions. If you'll raise your hand, John and I will come to you and you can ask a question. Who will be first? Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, thank you for the talk. I was wondering, what would you recommend to someone who's on the fence about becoming a, uh, a math major? Um, do it. <laughs> That's the short answer. The long answer is um, I was a physics major when I started uh, college. And the reason I was a physics major was, okay, I loved physics as well as math. But also, I had no idea what mathematicians did. And uh, when I took, you know, multivariable calculus, I still didn't know what mathematicians did. I took linear algebra, I still didn't know. Um, it wasn't until I finally took a course that had more proofs and uh, explored more of the combinatorics and number theory and network uh, side of mathematics that I really became entranced because that's when I realized that everything that I, that all those experiences I had were mathematics. Um, it, one of the things that I, that I didn't mention that also came out in 1980 was Rubik's Cube, right? And everybody, it seemed like everybody in my class had a Rubik's Cube. And never was it mentioned in my math class. It was designed by a mathematician to teach a particular type of mathematical structure. And it was never used in my math classes, K through 12. And I feel that was really unfortunate. That missed an opportunity because, you know, dozens of people in my class had them. We were always playing with them. We were, we were uh, learning mathematics without understanding that we were learning mathematics. So as a more practical, not just get a Rubik's Cube, uh, take math courses. Take math courses that you feel might interest you and see whether it's a fit. Uh, because it's true that for some people, the math is a means to, the, to an end. Uh, they're more interested in learning uh, how to compute than, how to, than what the underlying structure is. And those are two very different skills. Those are, those are two very useful skills. It's very useful to, to know how to compute things. But it's not, in my mind, what mathematics is all about. And that first course where you actually get to see a structure, that's going to tell you if you're interested in, in actually becoming a mathematician or not. Um, hi, Professor. Thank you so much. Um, I just had a small question. Um, regarding a lot of your like, really accessible examples to get into mathematics, um, if, you were to cho if you were to teach a course, uh, I mean, teach kids from K through college, per right. se, uh, on mathematics, assuming they didn't get really bored of you. <laughs> um, where would you start? How would you do things differently, personally, as you elev elevated them through mathematics? Yeah. Um, I would definitely, if, if I was uh, grand emperor of the mathematical K through 12 education, uh, start people on computers much earlier. Um, and oftentimes, computers and math courses are taught as, oh, these are in the same area, but now we're going to do math, now we're going to do computing. And it's when they come together that really something, I think, special happens. Um, I couldn't believe how any of my classmates understood Cartesian coordinates. Because the way it was taught was the professor would say, okay, now this is three, four. Uh, well, I shouldn't say professor, this was still in high school. Uh, would say three, four and plot it up there. And maybe then we would do y equals x squared and such. But at no time did any of my classmates get to play around with it. 
They never got to uh, move points around themselves. At the end of the teacher's lesson, we were handed a worksheet, which was a connect the dots, you know, and the list of coordinates. Uh, you've, you've probably done those yourselves. But again, that's, that's sort of a level zero sort of thing, where can you follow the instructions, not what happens when you have the freedom to, to move things around, uh, to play with things. So, so my short answer is I would try and introduce uh, computers far, far earlier. And uh, one of the aspects of that is things like a Rubik's Cube. A Rubik's Cube, in a sense, is a computer. Uh, you start with a certain state, you can make transformations to that state to move to, to other things. That's mathematics, and most of the people never get a chance to see that. They never get a chance to. And much of our mathematical education, unfortunately, is still geared towards becoming a clerk in the 1890s. And that's, that's wonderful if we lived in the 1890s and becoming a shopkeep was your, your goal in life. But, it's, but our questions are bigger than that, right? We need to know about uncertainty. We need to know about models. We need to know about larger aspects of the world. And I, I feel we're doing our students a disservice by concentrating on the minutia when we could be showing them more of the big picture. <laughs> yes, so what is operations research and what does it have to do with mathematics? Um, so operations research, the, the short answer is it's the uh, study of how to run an operation efficiently. So uh, how to get, you know, year 10 where all of your people are fed and not starving. Um, uh, apparently the trading in bushels for land really does help, so I guess civilization really does prosper with commerce. Uh, and, and that's what OR is about. It's about finding the ways to spend your resources to, to, to uh, optimize how you're working with limited constraints. Because being CMC students, you all know that your most limited constraint is time, right? Uh, you have all these things that you want to do. You have a limited number of hours in the day in which to do it. Um, you have way more opportunity at CMC than you have time to take advantage of those opportunities. So you are all operations researchers, <laughs> whether you know it or not, because you're all in the end deciding, okay, I'm going to join this club. I'm going to take this course. Um, and that's what OR does. It tries to uh, help uh, an operation understand what is important to them and make the types of decisions that allow them to maximize the use of their resources. Mark, um, I love reading science books. And often in these books, they describe that people felt that they found the truth because the math was beautiful. Right. It's often referred to beauty. So first of all, what is beauty in math? And why would it matter? Oh, yeah, two amazing questions. Um, beauty in math is one of those things like, um, like beauty in music. Um, so, so I'd mentioned the Imperial March earlier. For those who don't know, it goes bum, 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 bum. And you probably know, if I ask you, is that a major key or a minor key, you know instantaneously that's a minor key, right? It's kind of dark, it's kind of sinister. If I asked you, do you know the definition of a major key versus a minor key? Well, that's, that's a little harder, right? Unless you actually have taken some music theory, you probably don't know that, well, first there are three actually minor scales, and, and also a major scale goes uh, whole step, whole step, half step, a minor scale goes whole step, half step, uh, whole step. But you can tell that it's beautiful by the way things interact. And mathematicians have that same feeling when they look at a beautiful proof, when they look at a beautiful algorithm because of the way that it interacts. Now for me, okay, uh, this isn't something that's gonna go uh, into, the, into the Smithsonian anytime soon. But to me, that's beautiful. And the reason why is because it's balanced, um, it actually obeys something that photographers call the rule of thirds. The, the left peak is about a third of the way up and about a third of the way over. And it's that balance 
that, that lends it beauty. For a mathematician, a beautiful proof might be four steps where each of the steps are different, but roughly the same complexity and, and interest. There was a mathematician named Paul Erdős, and um, he had this notion of the book, which was the proofs that were the most beautiful in the world belonged in the book. And, and I've read some of those proofs, and, and yes, they are beautiful. But unlike music, where people can tend to appreciate beauty right off the bat, appreciating the, the beauty in mathematics often requires a lot more work, uh, a lot more looking at things that are not beautiful before you get <laughs> uh, to the beauty. And that's a shame, because I wish we could, we could move more quickly uh, towards the things that are beautiful. And I think we can, in a way, with the help of, of computers. One of my undergraduate professors when I was at MUD was uh, uh, Bob Borelli. And his differential equations class was uh, a joy, partially because we used computers to uh, plot out the paths of systems of differential equations. And seeing differential equations come alive, that was something very different from differential equation as a static thing that I solved. Uh, instead, it became a living thing that I could modify parameters and, and, and move around. That being said, there are beautiful methods to solve differential equations, and there are ugly methods to solve differential equations. Uh, it's a little bit like, uh, I would probably the closest comparison is to modern art. Uh, the first time you see a piece of modern art, the typical response is, my kid could have done that, right? <laughs> but then you look closer, and there's gradations of shading, uh, and maybe there's sort of an upward flow uh, in, in the piece. And there are subtle things that you don't notice when you look at it for the first time that, over time, you come to appreciate. And it's not until you see those subtle things that it all comes together. And that's, that's mathematics in a nutshell. Thank you for an interesting uh, talk. Th thank you for an interesting talk. I am puzzled a little bit about your uh, proposing to bring computers so quickly to the, right. to, uh, uh, to the class. Uh, in my experience, uh, risking uh, 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 people that think that they uh, understand because they see the s a solution, uh, but really have a very shallow basis to uh, their mathematical understanding. So can you uh, explore uh, elaborate a little bit on this. Yeah, so, so I've seen people that are very talented at symbol manipulation, that are very talented at following rules, who are unfortunately terrible mathematicians. And the reason is because they have no idea why those rules are there. They have no idea why the problems that they're solving are in place. I would rather see someone who could write a basic program to, to draw a picture than someone who knew their multiplication tables. And the reason for that is because they're ne they are rarely going to be called upon to, to multiply uh, you know, two-digit numbers by two-digit numbers uh, in their day-to-day -day life. They are going to be required to know, okay, what is the trend in a line? And if they've created a line for themselves using some sort of mathematical formula, if they've played around with the parameters and have gained an intuition, then they're going to remember it more strongly than if they just learned y equals mx plus b, and if m is positive, then it's upward sloping to the right, and if m is negative, it's downward sloping to the right. Now, there's a place for both types of education. I'm not saying just let people go wild on computers and never check in uh, for, for 12 years. But I think it's unfortunate that we live in an age where computing is simultaneously cheap and not being used at the most basic level because it's oftentimes the case that uh, we're not gonna let kids uh, learn how to program, we're not gonna let them use computers until they're in middle school or, or high school. And like most languages, like most uh, ways of understanding, 
if you can get a little taste of it early on, that's going to help you. I'm not, I'm not suggesting we sit kids in front of computers eight hours a day and have them feed fed telephonic lessons. But an hour of playing Hammurabi, is that really going to, to put them behind? And some kids won't respond, some, some will. All I know is, you know, 38 odd years later, I remembered that day of playing Hammurabi and literally nothing else about the first four years of my mathematics education. So I obviously learned something during those first four years, but that's what I remembered. Some of you may know another resource management game that became even more popular called the Oregon Trail. And that was another resource management game that just went viral in the days before the word viral existed in, in relation to computer software and sold literally millions of copies. And it's another game that like Hammurabi, it, its technical name in stochastic operations research is called a Markov decision process. But you don't need to know the name. You don't need to know how to solve a Markov decision process in order to enjoy Hammurabi, in order to enjoy the Oregon Trail. Uh, I, too, enjoy your enthusiasm for mathematics because I found earlier age I could uh, describe the physical world with a by mathematics, but I went over to the dark side and became a physicist. <laughs> My question is that much of what you've talked about is sort of designed for professional mathematicians. However, in our world today, especially in the area of public policy, much of what you're talking about, probabilities, uh, statistics, is really relevant, and of course global warming first comes to mind. Mm -hmm. What thoughts do you have about getting your ideas uh, out uh, for the more general uh, public as opposed to just uh, professional mathematicians? Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's, that's an extraordinarily good question. And, I, and to be honest, if I had a good idea for making the public aware of the importance of global warming, um, it, it would be what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I literally think that that would be more important than anything I could do. I love teaching, but I would leave in a moment if I felt I could convince anyone who is already in the other camp uh, that global warming was an imminent threat that required imminent action. Now, just because I say that, by the way, I don't want to mean you're all doomed. You're not. Uh, there are still actions that we can take that will make the world uh, a better place in the, in the coming 20, 50, or 100 years. But I do think it's unfortunate that the science, that the mathematics, has become politicized because originally it was during uh, Reagan's presidency, it was during J George H.W. Bush that uh, climate change committees were formed and people were talking about uh, some of these ideas like cap and trade back then and they came this close to, to happening. And this was before it became, oh, if you're a Republican, you must be against uh, uh, climate change. And, and that's unfortunate. And that, I really have no idea what to do. Yeah, I, I wish I did. I wish there was a way, but uh, yeah, computers aren't gonna solve that one. Uh, because the people who have um, uh, become entrenched on, on either side uh, have made it part of their identity at this point. And uh, while I'm a mathematician, I'm definitely not a sociologist or a psychologist, and I don't know how to break that down and get to the point where they're willing to, uh, to look at the mathematics. I'm Donald Reamer from Harvey Mudd, and thank you very much for the presentation. <laughs> that was very good. Uh, three of my children are CMCers, and I have eight grandchildren, and my children who are CMCers are having trouble helping their children with the Common Core. Could you comment on the Common Core? Okay, so uh, here's something that um, may be a surprise. I love the Common Core. The Common Core was a wonderful idea. The idea was to take problems, mathematical problems, and give people real world things that they could look at, understand, make them realize why they were doing the things that they were doing. But like uh, many people, I'm going to lay the blame on the textbook publishers. Uh, they saw, oh, now we're doing Common Core. Here's a textbook that's Common Core. 
there was no one giving them the stamp of approval to say this is Common Core versus not Common Core. They used Common Core as an excuse to redo all of their textbooks and sell them anew uh, to K through 12. And the unfortunate fallout was that people thought Common Core meant what the publishers thought was Common Core. And I've read those books, they are not Common Core. Uh, they are different then they're different enough that people can no longer help their children uh, with, their, with their math homework, but they're not different in the direction of Common Core. They're, they're, they're this weird Frankenstein monster thing uh, that unfortunately ended up being more uh, a, of a hindrance to learning mathematics than a help. Now, that being said, I have seen some programs, I have seen some worksheets that I like very much. But overall, I think Common Core got hijacked by the, by the publishing textbooks and made it so that we moved away from the goal of the Common Core, many of which actually echo what I was saying here, in that the goal of Common Core was to help people understand the underlying structures rather than solely concentrating on the computing aspects of mathematics, which had been the, the, the center of K through 12 education. We have time for one last question. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, one thing that I really enjoyed in your talk was sort of your distinction, as you elaborate a lot on, between um, just sort of the routine memorization of things like multiplication tables and then the deeper understanding. Um, but luckily, since most of us here have gotten past that point um, and know our multiplication tables and the basic understanding of <laughs> algebra, right. in your experience, what has helped you get to a deeper understanding of the more complicated topics that now you're teaching in college? Right, so, uh, so I'm teaching two sections of uh, probability, as many of you know, who uh, <laughs> were in that class. And I don't start off students the first day with a rousy game of Hammurabi, uh, because, uh, because our students are past that point. They, they've learned you know, how to make basic decisions by themselves. Uh, they, don't, they don't need that the, the way someone who's eight might need that. Um, so at that point, what I'm trying to do is help people develop intuitions. So, so in physics, one of the reasons I was a physics major was because you get such a head start, right? Everyone who's ever played catch with their dad has thrown a ball, has kicked a ball, has gotten an intuitive start on physics, has you know, uh, thrown a frisbee, they, they've gotten all sorts of interesting things with angular momentum, ridden a bike. And the problem is they tend not to get those same experiment experiences in mathematics because they're more difficult to do. So, so what I hope to do with the labs that I'm creating for my courses is give uh, students experimental uh, knowledge of mathematics, is to actually bring it to the point where they can see what's happening when they multiply a random variable by two and, and see that the, that the density estimate has spread out by a factor of two. That simple connection between the concept and the notation that all of us professional mathematicians have in our mind, that's the most difficult thing I found as a teacher to, to, to make to help students bridge that gap. So, so what I try and do is we tend to start with relatively simple labs where actually I start by having students roll dice and you know add them together much of the way the, the Apple II basic programming manual does. And by the end, well, you're gonna be doing some very interesting stuff, let's put it that way, uh, some very advanced stuff. And uh, the goal there is to build that connection. In the same way that when I throw a frisbee, I realize that I'm imparting angular momentum to that frisbee that's coming straight out of it, and so it doesn't want to turn because it, it comes back. The same way I have physical intuition, I want to give people that mathematical intuition. So instead of notation, they see concepts when, when they look at it. And once you get to that point, that's when level one and level two really open up to you. Please join me in thanking Professor Huber for his presentation. Thank you.